Good evening. My name is Melanie Townsend Diggs, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event on behalf of the Prince George's County Memorial Library System, where I serve as area manager for the Oxen Hill, Akakeek, Baden, and Surratt's Clinton Branch Libraries. We are honored to co-present tonight's Authors for Truth event with the PGCMLS Foundation and the Prince George's County Human Relations Commission. The Authors for Truth series features authors who have written works on the topics of social justice and equity. These conversations are a way to speak to the importance of these topics to our library system and surrounding communities, even our nation and world. An awesome added note is that the name of the series is derived from our African-American Reading Room and Innovation Space at the Oxen Hill Branch in the south area of the county, the Sojourner Truth Room. We are pleased to welcome William G. Thomas III to the online library tonight. He is the John and Catherine Engel Chair in the Humanities and Professor and in the Humanities and Professor of History at the University of Nebraska. He was co-founder and director of the Virginia Center for Digital History of the, at the University of Virginia. Dr. Thomas's new book, A Question of Freedom, The Families Who Challenged Slavery from the Nation's Founding to the Civil War, documents the history of the enslaved families of Prince George's County, Maryland. Filed hundreds of suits for their freedom against a powerful circle of slaveholders taking their cause all the way to the Supreme Court. Between 1787 and 1861, these lawsuits challenged the legitimacy of slavery in American law and put slavery on trial in the nation's capital. A question of freedom asked us to reckon with the moral problem of slavery and its legacies in the present day. You can borrow Dr. Thomas's book through the library at pgcmls.info or purchase a copy through our partner, Loyalty Bookstores at loyaltybookstores.com. Our moderator this evening is Renee Battlebrooks, Executive Director of the Prince George's County Human Relations Commission. I hope you enjoy the program. Thank you, Ms. Mullaney, very much for that introduction. And welcome, Professor Thomas. We are delighted to have you. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here, delighted to be here. Thank you, Renee. Absolutely. And before we begin our conversation, um, I wanted to invite you to read a passage or two from, from the book for our audience. Sure, that, that would be wonderful. Um, I'll start right at uh, at the beginning, um, and just uh, we'll see where this goes, shall we? Yes, thank okay. you. It was early morning when I crossed the Francis Scott Key Bridge from Virginia into Georgetown. College spires loomed in the distance, gray in the dawn light. I was headed to a religious service at Georgetown University that would acknowledge the trauma of a massive slave sale in 1838 a deal that shored up the finances of the struggling college and sent more than 200 men, women, and children into the cane fields of Louisiana. Most of the families torn apart in the sale could trace their lineage to White Marsh, one of the Jesuit-owned plantations located in Prince George's County, Maryland. I had been researching the history of the White Marsh families for nearly a decade, uncovering the lawsuits that they had brought against the Jesuits and other prominent Maryland slaveholders long before the 1838 sale. Some won their freedom, others didn't, but each of their cases challenged the legitimacy of slavery in American law. Together, they counted among the most significant freedom suits in U.S. history, and there were hundreds of others. Yet their particular stories would lead me, like the Georgetown Jesuits, 
to reckon with what I did not know about my own family and its role in this story. Thank you. Uh, and that does set the tone uh, wonderfully for the, for the book. I just want to hold the book up for anybody. I encourage you to, to purchase this book or check it out from the library. It, it's wonderful. Um, it's sobering. Um, it brings up lots of uh, mixed emotions, but it, it really lets you see that um, everything is gray. Uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, it re reiterates that. Um, for those who haven't had the opportunity to read, in your preface, you talk about um, at this the service, this religious service that you were going to, to mm -hmm. commemorate the, or to, to, to confront the sale of um, the slaves. Yes. You, you talk about something that the presenter said, and he talked about that this act had betrayed the name of Jesus. Can you expound a little bit upon that and sort of that theme? Yeah, well, the Jesuits um, at that liturgy uh, were going to apologize effectively for uh, the sale, um, and Reverend Tim Kaseki uh, stood to address the the congregation, the descendants of the families that had been sold in 1838. And uh, uh, he said they that the Jesuit order had betrayed the name of Jesus. And it was, um, it's something that I, I was thinking a lot about. Um, I was particularly thinking about the parable of the wicked tenants in this sort of story of that Jesus uh, tells as a parable of um, a master who um, um, turns over a vineyard to, to tenants who then um, uh, kill the messengers who are sent to, uh, from the master and kill the son and enslave the others and, um, and despoil the inheritance, essentially. Um, and as I thought about that parable, that parable and our, our national inheritance and thought about its application to us today, um, you know, I, I found myself thinking about the, uh, the, the, about slavery in those terms as um, a, a despoiling of, of the, the foundation of equality and freedom and liberty in the ideals of the nation and, um, uh, and a failure, a moral failure um, to recognize that what we have is not ours, um, but is given to us by others. And so, uh, so you know, at the liturgy, um, I mean, one of the things that, that I reflected on is uh, the, the book is really about the particular families who experience slavery. And I think when we talk about slavery, we often talk about it in abstract terms. Many Americans do. And Frankly, many textbooks depict American history in these kind of abstract terms as a nameless, largely faceless institution. And I wanted to, uh, to bring the experience of particular families. Slavery was a particular, was, it was, slavery was about the enslavement of particular people and particular families. It, it wasn't, there was nothing abstract about it. And so, uh, uh, so right at the beginning of this uh, this book, I try to set that up for the reader to see that that, that what's coming is a a deep investigation into slavery as an experience that particular families endured. A, a couple of things that you said there. Um, I know that when I was reading, um, when I first when I got to the first reference uh, about Francis Scott Key and sort of the complexities there. Um, yeah. And then I, I did my own little quick, you know, 21st century research, looking at the, the Star Spangled Banner and all the things that I'd heard and reading all of the stanzas for, for that song and reading different people's opinion on sort of where he fell on the side of slavery. And, and um, could you expound on the complexities of Francis Scott Key and where he, his, his, uh, interaction in this whole, whole narrative. Right. Well, 
you know, the temptation is to uh, of some is to find a, a white savior in the story, and um, Francis Scott Key might fit that bill. He he represented over a hundred enslaved families who sued for freedom uh, more than any other lawyer I could find in D.C. Um, now in Prince George's County, Maryland, Gabriel Duval, another lawyer who becomes a very significant judge, a Supreme Court judge, um, he was deeply uh, active in freedom suits for enslaved families. But Key, uh, you know, I mean, I guess I would say a couple of things about Key. And it's an incredibly complex question you've asked. Uh, and he is, um, is a figure, well, first of all, it's tempting to think that the lawyers are bringing these cases, that because Key represents over 100 enslaved families, that somehow Key is making a, an, uh, an effort to end slavery with these lawsuits. He may have told himself that he was an upstanding humanitarian person um, for doing this, this kind of work. Um, but what I found in researching and reflecting on this question is key. The lawyers were not leading this, uh, freedom suit effort. The enslaved families were leading these efforts. And that hit home to me, uh, as I was reading the, depositions uh, in the case of Charles Mahoney. And I, I, we probably will come back to this, but I'll just say that when I was looking at these depositions, these are statements of witnesses who are testifying about the status of Charles Mahoney's ancestor, who he claimed was a free woman. And so these are testimony, these are statements about whether she said she was free, who she talked to and so forth. And the important point here is that when I finally read those depositions for the 20th time and saw something I'd not seen before, I just hadn't noticed it. Charles Mahoney was in the room. He was present. So here's an enslaved man who was present for these depositions. His voice may have been silenced in the archive, but his presence was not. And his presence spoke volumes uh, to me about who was leading these uh, freedom suits. Charles Mahoney um, found the witnesses. Charles Mahoney w traveled from Prince George's County to Washington, D.C. to find white men and women who knew something about his ancestor. Charles Mahoney was doing all of this, um, and so were other enslaved uh, plaintiffs who brought these freedom suits. And Francis Scott Key, I mean, he's, he's trying a lot of cases. Some of them he gives a lot of attention to. Others, he, he kind of flubs, you know? He's not really paying attention. So mm -hmm. Key uh, is a figure who's a, a, a working lawyer, um, and he certainly derives a great deal of, um, I think, self-esteem from participating in these freedom suits as a humanitarian and a and an, and an Episcopalian, um, but uh, by the night by the by the eighteen thirties, he he's really begun to more publicly criticize black freedom, and that's an important part of the book. He um, he becomes a more public, vocal critic of of freedom uh, and of free blacks. And so he disavows his participation in the freedom suits. Yeah, I, I found that uh, illuminating, really. Um, so two things I want to make sure that we uh, circle back around. One, um, and I dropped my paper just a moment. These are my okay. notes for you. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to have a Saturday Night Live moment here. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> The... Um, you know, he flubbed one of the cases in, in a pretty big way um, by not um, by not doing his research, his due diligence. You know, right. as an attorney, I would have been I would have been sued or disbarred for malpractice. Can you talk first of all a little bit about that, and then I do want to come back to the Charles Mahoney case. But, sure, yeah. But let's talk a little bit about his flub and yeah. what it cost. Yeah, he. So in this 
And, th- and th- this case is one that where I really started this whole investigation, my whole journey on into this uh, book began with a case called Queen v. Hepburn. And it's a, it, it's a case that comes before the Supreme Court, and it's the foundational case in American law for uh, the procedural rule of hearsay. And this is, you know, testimony that is secondhand. It's, it's, it's inadmissible on, in, an, in a court of law and under most conditions. And um, the, the case that really introduces this in American law is Queen v. Hepburn. And I didn't know much about this case, uh, but when I looked into it, what caught my attention was that here here was a case cited widely as the foundational case for the hearsay rule, and it's an enslaved woman's petition for her freedom. She is suing for her freedom. And so the testimony that was disallowed, that was rendered inadmissible, was the oral testimony that would have proved her ancestors' freedom. And so here was this rule whose origins really um, uh, go to um, the perpetuation of slavery. I mean, it, and, and, and the enslavement of a, of a family. It's a, it just seemed a, a monstrous historic injustice, right? And I, um, I, I looked into every aspect of this case, and he, at the critical moment, Francis Scott Key, doesn't quite recognize the what the defense attorney has done in a, in um, objecting to the hearsay testimony of the one deposition, the one deposition that he has with the ancestors' words directly reported. Right. Uh, you know, her words never made it into a court of law, and yet they made it down through four generations. And actually had been recorded from a white man who testified under oath. Right. So, you know, so so hearsay had been allowed in all of the Maryland courts for decades in these freedom suits. And it was leading to a wide, uh, a large number of, um, of successful freedom suits. And there's no question that slaveholders wanted to defeat those freedom suits. And this was one way, in fact... Uh, Gabriel Duvall, the judge in the Supreme Court who dissents, says it disallowing this kind of evidence pulls these claims up by the roots forever. You'll you'll never be able to prove freedom based on ancestry anymore because oral testimony will is effectively um, inadmissible. And Key misses this. He misses the uh, he does not object to their uh, hearsay. And then when they object to his. He's caught flat-footed, and um, there are other sort of evidentiary issues. The will that is introduced is the same old will uh, from um, a slaveholder that is um, it is transcribed incorrectly, and so the it's a it's effectively a, a red herring. It doesn't mean anything, and um, he introduces it as if it's uh, as, as if it's valid. And so here's a here's a case. That's the foundational case for for hearsay. And the documentary record is um, a fabric, essentially inaccurate. Right, flawed. And the oral history is essentially accurate. And I did a lot of research on the circumstantial evidence, try to build up that that oral evidence, but it's disallowed. And so um, he, I think he misses this uh, at that moment, and it's a crucial moment for for Mina Queen and her daughter Louisa, it really is with tragic with tragic results. Um, and uh, you know, as I was reading, I was uh, thinking that some years prior to this, how uh, the case had been continued, continued, continued to send this commission to England to to find records, at, right? And I thought, well, nothing prevented Francis Scott Key and all due diligence from seeking records that were available. Um, right. But I was also struck by how um, different, well, the Supreme Court and, and different judges literally twisted themselves in knots mm. to avoid um, finding for the plaintiffs. And 
creating these laws until really in the end, they box themselves in. I mean, brilliantly in the last case, but um, so much to talk about and not enough time, but yeah. tell <laughs> that's <laughs> but a good problem to have. And, I agree. Yeah. Um, the Charles um, Mahoney. Yeah. Um, yeah. That case. Yeah. Well, um, you know, Charles Mahoney uh, was enslaved at the Jesuit plantation at White Marsh. And, and, and if I can just for, for one second, you know, sure. I, I had a I have a separate list. So I have all of my list of potential questions and I have a separate list that I have for myself. <laughs> OK, of places that I want to visit once COVID yeah. is over or I could do drive bys right now. But where I saw it on the map, but where exactly was White Marsh? Sure. Um, it's off of 450 today. Um, right at the Patuxent River Bridge. Um, it's it's not far from uh, that bridge. It used to be called Priest's Bridge. Okay. That bridge over um, uh, right at um, what is today Sacred Heart Catholic Church. Okay. And there's a, there's a White Marsh Park that PG County owns, I believe, in that area. This is not the same as White Marsh um, around Baltimore. Exactly. Um, yeah. It's a, so, but the 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 White Marsh Park right there uh, is the the that is the Jesuits White Marsh Plantation. Okay. And they called it White Marsh because of the shimmering um, uh, uh, clay clay underneath the Patuxent in that area, and it shimmered white, and so they called it White Marsh. Um, but the Jesuits the Jesuits effectively inherited that plantation and the enslaved families there from a planter named James Carroll. Um, and James Carroll was related to uh, Charles Carroll of Carrollton. Um, it's a big, big, obviously, family in that part of Maryland. Uh, the, the Jesuits at White Marsh in, in 1789, where I start the book, decided to found a college at Georgetown, and they also decided to start selling enslaved people they deemed too old to work. And that was in May of 1789. They, they, they have this meeting, and they make that decision at White Marsh. And so the Jesuits have four or five other plantations, several hundred enslaved people on, at those plantations, and word would have certainly spread. Right, I mean, uh, of the decision that the Jesuits had taken, and so within really um, eighteen months, um, Charles Mahoney had filed a suit for his freedom. He was thirty-four years old. His his aunts and uncles there were in their sixties and seventies. They would likely be sold and separated from the family. Uh, Edward Queen also filed his freedom suit. He and Charles Mahoney file their suits on. On the same day, and they, um, Edward Queen's mother, Phyllis, was in her 70s. And so, so, you know, the Queen family and the Mahoney family are the first black families to file freedom suits based on descent from a free black woman. Now, there had been earlier freedom suits, the Butler family in particular, claiming descent from a free white woman. But the, but the, uh, the Queens and the Mahoney's were making a, an entirely diff, a, a different claim, similar under the law, but, but it was uh, socially and culturally different, right? Yeah. And so the question really was, had Charles Mahoney's ancestor, a woman named Ann Joyce, come from England? Had she been in England? If she had been in England, then she could claim to have been free under English law. Uh, being on English soil, there was no slavery on English soil. Now, I should say that when I started out this, re this book, I, I didn't realize, and this is one of the most important themes of the book, is that slavery was contested in the law and in English law for centuries before uh, the American Republic is founded. 
And so um, it wasn't that slavery was a given, would somehow be secure in the law. And when Charles Mahoney brings this case um, and has testimony, and the same is true for Edward Queen, that his ancestor had been in England, you know, all of the English precedent that had ruled slavery as a violation of natural law would come into a Maryland courtroom. Would be, and if the court validated it, well, what did that say about slavery in Maryland? You know, so so the 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 stakes were uh, Renee were were momentous, right? For, in yeah. these in these freedom suits, and in Charles Mahoney's case, uh, this is. This is the the in in my view the most important freedom suit in American history. I mean, Dred Scott is also very significant for the reasons that we can discuss. But um, but Charles Mahoney, it's it's a heroic effort on his part to because it it's it takes three jury trials, um, two appeals right. before it's twelve years yes. of litigation yes. before it's finally over and. He wins his freedom. The jury decides in his favor. And then it's appealed, sent back to the trial uh, court. And, um, and you know, he, he, he loses because essentially the, the slaveholders have, you know, possibly fabricated some evidence. They've certainly drudged up some evidence that's not very believable. Um, but it was enough of an alternative uh, um for the jury to to come to the conclusion that his ancestor must have come from Africa directly, but the the point here is that Charles Mahoney, um, you know, his is a twenty five year effort to free his family. Yeah, he, yeah. I was struck by the resilience that was woven yeah. throughout. Um, just you know how how do you how do you pick yourself up? And go on. I mean, you have to because it's a choice, but you, you win your freedom and then it's taken. And then the appeals and 12 years. I mean, in our current society, you know, a week is a long time for our instant gratification culture. Um, and, and when you think 12 years, um, the other thing that I think maybe should be interesting to the to people that are listening and haven't had the opportunity yet to read the book is this. This idea of um, you know enslaved people having access to the court system, and you talk yeah. about that, right? And having uh, the freedom of movement, and how that maybe was unique in Maryland because in Prince George's County, the generations of enslaved families that stayed together. And can you sort of talk about maybe how that was different from Louisiana, where you had right. people that were not connected? Right. I think this is a really important dynamic. Um, in Maryland, and it's it's also important to recognize that much of slavery of of enslavement was aimed at destroying family, um, breaking kinship, um, removing people, separating them, uprooting them. That is what the the that is what the domestic slave trade in the United States did. Was it? Um, it tore apart and separated families. And under those conditions, it makes it very difficult to pass on generational knowledge. Um, and that's exactly the point that enslavers were, that's why they, that, one of the reasons they were doing uh, that. So the enslaved families in Maryland, the Mahoney's, the Queen's, the Shorter's, the Thomas's, the Butler's, and others, uh, were determined, of course, to remain rooted, right? I mean, in being rooted and stable, uh, intergenerational families and family, family networks can be built and sustained and loved and cherished. And that uh, is at the heart of this story because, um, you know, Ma the Mahoney's are five generations deep in Maryland. And they are able to, they, they pass on um, legal knowledge and legal understanding. Um, and the queens do as well. 
Uh, so, uh, so that is an absolutely crucial factor in the ability of uh, Charles Mahoney and Edward Queen and then Priscilla Queen and Mina Queen to manipulate the law and to take the law that the slaveholders made and turn it to freedom. Yeah, yeah. Um, share with share with our listeners a little bit about the the uh, Anne Joyce case and um, you know the difference between from and in in <laughs> yes England and you know what that really right right well uh, Renee you're ref- yes you're referring to this. Um, this uh, set of arguments between the attorneys, uh, the attorneys for Charles Mahoney uh, and uh, the attorneys for John Ashton, the Jesuit priest. Um, and the, fellow there. Yeah. And this, uh, th- this, this essentially in the middle of this case of this litigation, there's an argument before the Maryland court um, in which uh the, the question becomes, well, was Ann Joyce, um, this black woman uh, and Charles Mahoney's ancestor, was she ever in England? Um, and Mahoney's lawyers are uh, arguing that she came from England. The boat, the ship came from England. She, uh, she embarked effectively somewhere from London and, um, uh, Uh, and came to the Maryland colony uh, as an indentured servant, not as an enslaved person. Um, And Ashton's attorneys effectively argue that someone can be um, from England without ever having, someone can come from England without ever having been in England. And so there's this argument over the preposition from and the preposition in, had she set foot in England. And so these theories are spun out by the, uh, by the slaveholders' uh, attorneys um, that try to suggest that she actually may, ha- whether she came from England or not, the Mah- Mahoney has not proven that she was ever in England. And so it's these kinds of, par- the, the parsing of language in this way to perpetuate the enslavement of the Mahoney family and the yeah. Joyce family. I'd like to say that, you know, in my litigation days, that that wasn't the same still, not <laughs> perpetuate slavery, but, you know, it's called blowing smoke. Uh, yeah. But this smoke blowing uh, really had grave and precedential effect. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, there is a... Um, Somewhere in your book, you talk about sort of confronting the truth. And I, I don't want to look at my squiggly notes too, too, uh, too closely, but, but you talk about sort of, right, confronting the truth and what it means. And, and that made me wonder about um, your views. And if you need more context, I'll find it, or context, I'll find it. But um, sort of your views of the 1619 project and sort of the validity of that, or maybe not, and sort of, you know, from a, his, a historian. Yeah. Um, I do have some thoughts about that. I think we need to uh, confront the full history, the complete history of the nation. Um, and as I wrote this, a book, I, I am, I'm, was, and am concerned with the standard, I guess, narrative that many Americans have about the founding of the nation. Um, because essentially, um, the revolution, the American revolution is often depicted as an inevitable flourishing of liberty. Um, and slavery, if, if, that's the, and that, if that's the case, often slavery is portrayed as somehow incidental to the development of the nation. The nation's um, pr- progress or flourishing of liberty was, was presumably un, not inhibited by, by slavery, that slavery was somehow incidental to the revolution and really to the course of the nation's history. But the 
the freedom suits tell a different story, right? Um, they show us that slavery was contested in the law uh, before the revolution and during and after the revolution. And so slavery doesn't remain as some vestige of colonial society that's bound to disappear, that's just inevitably going to go away. Because, and it, it's not going, it, it's not because it's obviously incompatible with the founding principles of liberty and equality and natural rights. Instead, slavery had gained sanction under the law and gained sanction under the Constitution. And here's the crucial point. It's not that that happened quietly or somehow without anyone taking notice. Um, it, it was contested. And uh, so I think, we, I think we have to, I think the 1619 Project helps us begin to see a more full and complete history of the United States and, um, uh, and that, that the founding principles of equality and liberty are indeed principles at the founding. Um, they are uh, uh, at the core of the nation's identity, but slavery is also uh, and was a contested uh, matter. Um, and and so that I think is where where we are, and 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 it's a very a positive and and encouraging um, sign, I think, to see this discussion, this public discussion, this public reckoning with the nature of the founding. This is good for the United States. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, that's how we grow, frankly. If we talk in, in, in difficult conversations, especially, it's how we grow in an honest way. Um, as a lawyer reading the book, I'm thinking before you answer the question, like who's paying for this? How are they? How are they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so maybe if you could yeah. explain that to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is a really good question. I had a hard time, uh, Renee, finding direct evidence about. Um, uh, which, who was paying lawyers? Lawyers tend to keep those files pretty, pretty <laughs> separate, and <laughs> they don't generally go into archival collections, do they? Um, so yeah, generally, not. <laughs> it's confidential client privilege, and yeah. So, um, but what I did find is uh, a couple things. One is that in Maryland there was a flat rate for appearances um, in the various courts. And in the, these were civil actions. That's a very important part of this story. Um, the freedom suits were civil suits, okay? And so under uh, 19th century civil uh, law and procedure, um, not only could the enslaved not speak, uh, but the slaveholders could not, the defendants could not testify on their in their own behalf. Right. And so the contest was really, in a way, a kind of a, a little more of a fair field in that sense. Of course, slaveholders held enormous power in um, Prince George's County society and in the courts, but um, slaveholders literally could not speak uh, who were being sued. And... Um, you know, the lawyers, I think, would, if they succeeded, they would be paid. It was kind of a plaintiff's bar, so to speak. Um, I will say that later, uh, I've, I certainly um, found indirect evidence that some, some families, like the Bell family, who, whose freedom suits, there are five major freedom suits that the Bell family brings, one of which goes to the Supreme Court in the 1840s. Um, the Bell family, I think, probably paid attorneys, and they, uh, they were enslaved people who had been uh, directed by slaveholder, the slaveholder to hire themselves out. So they were effectively enslaved and 
but living in DC, hiring themselves out, capturing their own wages. Um, and you might wonder, well, why would a slaveholder do that? And there are a lot of different uh, reasons that that might come about, but in, it doesn't stop the slaveholder from, let's say, mortgaging the body of the enslaved person to borrow money from the bank to do all sorts of things. So, so the it, it this is in no way a slaveholder's disavowal of slavery. It is in fact um, a peculiarity of of this uh, re slave regime in which slaveholders uh, can both um, reap the benefits of slaveholding and not have to pay the costs. Um, and so, so the bells actually, uh, I think, are paying the litigation fees. Um, through their hard earnings, and and I think I think Mahoney does too. Frankly, I think actually uh, he probably in negotiating for his freedom um, had to pay something. We don't have any evidence of that, but I think it's highly likely. And so they yeah. worked, yeah, and they pulled their resources. Families pulled their resources and shared those resources to litigate. So. You said mortgage. So talk to us what I would call sort of a Ponzi scheme that uh, ended up sort of towards the end of, of the book and how people had, you know, multiple mortgages promised their freedom or this, uh, you know, the will that upon, you know, the death would yeah. be freed in 10 years or after a certain age and how, you know, people are what we would call in today's language in good faith doing what they were supposed to with the promise of freedom. But talk to us a little bit about how some of these people went, some of the uh, slaveholders went bankrupt between Louisiana and Maryland and this whole I, scheme is really what I call it. Yeah. Well, this became particularly apparent in the 1830s when the financial uh, crash occurs in the United States at that time. And this is the, precisely the moment when the Jesuits um, negotiate the sale of over 200 men, women, and children to Louisiana. But the Jesuits are not alone. There are thousands and thousands of slaveholders who sell enslaved people to Louisiana and Mississippi um, in, this, in this period in the 1830s. And now, given... The, the Prince George's County connection and the families that I was writing about, the Jesuit sale was an extraordinarily important one because it, not only because it was large, but because it separated these families ir um, irrevocably, really, until quite recently. And um, uh, because it so clearly shows us what you're talking about or what you're asking about. Um, in the language of the 19th century, it was something called hypothecation. Uh, it's a fancy technical term in the law, but the, uh, the, 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 the brutal reality of it was that enslaved people's bodies could be mortgaged um, to extend credit to slaveholders. And they effectively slaveholders twice mortgaged and sometimes thrice mortgaged enslaved people. So um, in the same way that a, a, a mortgage on a house, there might be a second mortgage on a house. Uh, there might be a second mortgage on enslaved people. And what that did was, um, in the 1830s, of course, was extend this enormous amount of credit to slaveholders to expand into the sugar fields of Louisiana, and they did, and they overexpanded, and then the bubble burst, and the creditors are calling in the loans, and what is securing those loans? Enslaved bodies. And who would then be separated from uh, their families? Because this was, this was, uh, this is a, a really important and disturbing uh, part of this story, enslaved families sent to Louisiana by the Jesuits and other other slaveholders, in this situation, they they were often more they were mortgaged without knowing they were mortgaged. Okay, 
And um, when the creditors came calling, it became clear that slaveholders had double mortgaged some people and not double mortgaged others. And so in, enslaved families could be separated by the creditors based on the paper that slaveholders had signed. And so you said it was a Ponzi scheme and it, it really does have that effect in the, but the, the, what's, uh, what's at the core of it are, are human beings and people yeah. who've been, who've been, uh, you know, separated from uh, their loved ones and, um, uh, and who are, um, have really no power in this situation. Yeah, I was also struck by the, you know, the certification of freedom by the court. And yeah. um, uh, one of the last cases that you wrote about where she has it, she's been living, she yes. and her both free and moving about, buying property, signing contracts. Yes. Living under apparent freedom in the District of Columbia. And because the will freed them and the recipient of the will didn't want it and sort of explain that and how she is um, sent to Louisiana with her daughter. And it's yeah. like heart wrenching. Yeah. There are um, numerous uh, cases in which uh, a will is overturned uh, or a deed of manumission is overturned. So in the bell family cases, the end of the book um, and the, the, little girl at the end is Eleonora Bell, who's eight and a half years old when she brings her freedom suit um, into the D.C. court, and she's 11 when it goes to trial. Um, and, you know, the, the Bell family, this was exactly the situation. Um, the Daniel Bell had negotiated with a white slaveholder who, who enslaved his wife, Mary and their six children. And, and, and he was free for, yes. Yeah, well, Daniel, Dan, at that time, actually, when he negotiates that, he's not free. Ah, okay. He's an enslaved man, and he negotiates the freedom of um, his wife and children. He knows that this slaveholder, a man named Robert Armstead, is dying, and he's sick. Uh, he probably had cancer, and he's dying, and he's in the almshouse, uh, he can, he, he, uh, is receiving some medical care there, but he is really at the end of his life. And Daniel, um, goes to him, uh, partly because he knows that Robert Armstead signed a proclamation, a, a petition that had been circulating in Washington, DC to abolish slavery in the district. So he knows that Robert Armstead is a signatory to this abolitionist petition. Right. And he goes and he, I, I, we, we don't know what he said to Robert Armstead, but he walks away with a signed notarized by the court deed, um, freeing Mary and the six children. And Renee, your, your question is, is really what happens next? Because he dies two days later uh, Robert Armstead, the slaveholder, dies two days later, and the widow contests the deed, right? She never, she, her position is that he was at the end of his life and he was not of sound mind. And the Bell family brings a whole series of freedom suits to try to, I mean, here's a notarized signed deed and freedom certificates have been issued by the court on the basis of that deed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and when the widow tries to sell the children, have them appraised and sell them, it becomes apparent that she's not going to recognize uh, the deed's validity, right? That's and right. so that's when the Bell family files their freedom suits, and they lose all of them. Yeah. And the courts, uh, the courts, uh, you know, the juries believe the witnesses are uh, the argument of the widow, you know? And uh, so Eleonora Bell, 11 years old, is the last freedom trial. And um, w only war will end slavery, really, in the District of Columbia and Maryland. And, and isn't it part of this case where the daring escape is is 
um, oh, attempted yes. and yeah, uh, right. A lot of people yeah. get into the, trouble. The Pearl, one of the most the, the largest uh, es escape attempt in American history is is on the on the schooner, the Pearl, uh, out of Washington D.C. And I didn't realize this. You know, I mean, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote about this. Um, J uh, Daniel Bell, the Bell family is the they organize the the Pearl escape attempt when all of the freedom suits have failed and Mary's suit has failed and the children's uh, the children's the, the, the children could be sold at any moment and Daniel organizes this in 1848. So he starts this in 1835 with, when he gets the deed. And in 1848, it's still, you know, uh, unresolved, and um, and they've lost it in in these in the court cases, and they they attempt the the pearl escape. Yeah, so so, so sorry. I mean, you, you made it very real, as you said, not just something ethereal that you're taught in school where there's no feeling, and yeah. Right. So this, I I heartily uh, encourage everyone to read to read this book. Um, I did want to ask, uh, and we'll yeah. see if there are any questions, but before I look to see whether there are any questions yes. from our, our, our people that are uh, listening. Sure. Other than the family connection that you discovered, what, you know, can you describe maybe some other surprises or, or one that, that really caught you off guard or you didn't see that one coming or maybe an overall impression, but something that when you started this, um, this is not what you thought. Um, yeah. Um, well, I, I'll say a couple things. Um, one is, um, you know, there's a case that I, I write about in which an enslaved woman, uh, Charlotte Dupuis, sues the outgoing Secretary of State of the United States, uh, Henry Clay, who is the leader of the Whig Party. It's the, it's the, the major uh, pa party other than the Democratic Party. Um, he had been Speaker of the House. He was a senator from Kentucky. He was you know, a presidential candidate. And I think one of the things that, that caught was surprising was to see Clay's reaction. Um, and I try to uh, talk about this in, in the book, try to narrate this unfolding drama, really, around um, Decatur House, to, which is uh, right there on Lafayette Square in D.C. That's where Charlotte was held. And... Um, you know, she's from the Eastern Shore of Maryland. She's from Dorchester County. And she comes from a family that had purchased its freedom. And so uh, the, the surprising thing, and it shouldn't be surprising, is the personal response of Clay. He's, he's offended. He cannot believe that Charlotte, will, that Charlotte has sued him in court. And I think this is one of the things that, um, that I try to, uh, illuminate in the book is that this, these were personal confrontations about slavery as well. This was, um, the slaveholders were personally brought into court to defend themselves and as defendants. And I, and I think we see in Clay's reaction, uh, it's swift, it's merciless, it's uncompromising. It's, um, he simply cannot, uh, he cannot think, he, can, he does not allow himself to think that there is any legitimate claim to freedom or that slavery should be contested at all. And I think we, uh, uh, we you know, I, I think that was this, this, the, the, the bareness, the, the clarity of that response. It's one of the few direct responses we have from a slaveholder to the court. Yeah. And it, it, 
it speaks volumes. Uh, um, and I, I will ask uh, the question that's here, but I was also struck uh, in one place you write about um, during this uh, sort of back and forth of questioning that um, I don't remember which case it was, but the enslaved person then gets to, you know, nobody objected to him asking questions. Of the yeah. Way. Okay. So that was, that was another, um, and I mentioned earlier, Charles Mahoney's presence right. in the deposition. Yeah. He's in the deposition room. That's right, yes. And that was one of the surprising moments for me because I'd been looking at this for years and I had not really um, focused in on, well, who was there? Who was actually in the room right. when this was taken? Um, and one of the things that I do uh, in the book is I turn those third-person depositions around into the first person. Right. Because when we read them today... It's a stenographer taking down the depth, saying, he said this, he said that, the deponent said this, the deponent said that. Well, um, when we turn them around into the first person, uh, we can recover what the, the testimony really sounded like, what it was. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, in several instances, enslaved people in, present in the deposition— interrupt and ask a question. Yeah, yeah. For Fact. clarification. And it's and so there they are in the record. And I thought it was really important to follow uh, these families' actions. You know, what do they do? Yeah. Um, and so this is one of those moments where I was deeply, deeply, um, uh, yeah, uh, surprised yeah. in a good way. Yeah, yeah. I have so many more questions, but we are uh, running out of time. Okay. Um, so one of the questions uh, asked of the audience, our audience is, are there some specific major examples of the cases you discuss in the book being referenced, uh, referred to, I'm sorry, as precedent later on? I, I think we touched a little bit on that. We, we did. I mean, Queen yes, V. Hepburn is, yeah. the, is the case. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's routinely, well, for a century, it was sort of routinely placed in uh, uh, every reference to hearsay as, as precedent and just relied on. But nobody bothered to look into what the consequences of that uh, precedent were. Right. I, I'm going to go uh, pull out my uh, hearsay, my uh, mm. my evidence book to look to see whether that case was sure. uh, cited yeah. many moons ago. Um, uh, okay. So I want everyone to go and get this book, buy this book or check it out, but buy it is good. Loyalty, we said, is one of the partners of the library. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Thomas, for spending this hour with us, for sharing your knowledge, and for writing this incredible book. Um, and we um, we look forward to your next project, yeah. most thank definitely. You. Um, I also want to just let everybody know of two events that are coming up. So on Thursday, December 10th, uh, we're welcoming Jennifer DeLeon in conversation. Her book is Don't Ask Me Where I Am From. So that should be fascinating. And on December 14th, Zach Smedley, he'll be coming to talk about his book, Deposing Nathan. Um, so again, I encourage you to get this book, Loyalty Books in DC and or Silver Spring. I want to thank our library partners um, who, as always, um, do a fantastic job. So thank you, Nick. Kyla, I'd like to thank from the Human Relations Commission and again, Melanie for her opening remarks. And of course, uh, Professor Thomas, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed it and I am glad was glad to be here. It's fantastic. Thank you. And everyone have a wonderful evening.